Hello. Good evening. Welcome. This is the Alliance Francaise Dublin uh, live event. My name is Rob Doyle. I'm a writer from Dublin and um, I'm going to read some of my latest book, The Threshold, recently published by Bloomsbury. Um, I wrote some of the book, quite a bit of the book in France, mostly in Paris, and um, a, a fair amount of the book is actually set in France too, Paris and other places. Uh, it's a very kind of personal autobiographical book about travel, life, love, loneliness, sex, sanity, insanity, uh, drugs, literature, writing, books, art, and many other things. So um, because this is an Alliance Francaise event, I thought I would read um, a section set in Paris and France, um, and also a kind of a little bit about a French writer, which is Georges Bataille. For three years in my early 20s, I underwent weekly psychoanalysis, lying on a couch in a book-lined study to talk about my most humiliating secrets, anguished intuitions, and perverse desires. On the shelves of that study, I noticed a number of books by Georges Bataille. Like many of his readers, I knew Bataille only through his early pornographic novel, Story of the Eye. My girlfriend and I used to read passages of the novel to each other, and we were vaguely, perhaps dutifully aroused by the imagery, but for the most part, we were just amused. It read like a screwball sad, a pair of young libertines enact weird erotic scenarios involving eggs, eyeballs, priests, and even bulls' testicles. At moments when I feared I was saying too much to my analyst, being too open about my aberrant thoughts, the sight of Bataille's books on his shelves reassured me. If he was reading this stuff, he could take anything I might serve up. Bataille came to fascinate me more for his theoretical works and for his life and personality than for his fiction. Two key words across his writing were ecstasy and excess. The words resonated with me, engaged as I then was in my own pursuit of ecstasy by means of excess, which, as it happened, often meant swallowing excessive quantities of MDMA at raves, festivals and concerts. I felt myself to be at war with the world. The values I lived by stemmed in part from the conviction attained at the age of six, 16 and never really discarded that work, as it was generally experienced by people of my own working class background, i.e. dreary toil that you didn't really believe in, was to be avoided as far as possible. Further, the exact contrary of such toil was the overpowering, life-justifying rapture that my friends and I found in music, clubs, art, books, and drugs. Bataille, it seemed to me, had done the anthropological research to back up these ecstatic intuitions of mine. In his book, Erotism, he argued that human beings had lost themselves in the work world, rendering themselves means rather than ends. The systems of rationality and order we had erected to protect us from the dangers of nature had grown too rigid and powerful. They now enslaved rather than served us. But Ty was clear on what was the solution to this, to this mass human self-abnegation, exuberant eroticism and rapturous excess, which brought the sacred back into earthly existence reinstating human sovereignty against a dreary capitalist world that sought to deny it. Cosmic serfdom was cast off through useless acts of pleasure, self-destruction and sexuality. Although I discovered him via my studies in philosophy, a large part of Bataille's appeal was the alternative he offered to philosophy's stock in trade, namely sober reflection and careful reasoning. 
while I found I could do very well in philosophy, intuiting what was needed to impress my lecturers and get good marks, I really wasn't into sober reflection and careful reasoning. When it got right down to it, I wasn't even really into philosophy. What had drawn me to the subject was its promise of astonishing flights of thought, shocking and dangerous ideas, a sense of vertigo, vistas of the sublime tinged with madness and horror. As the vast majority of academic, academic philosophy turned out to be pretty antithetical to all that, I spent much of my time studying the subject in a state of catatonic boredom. During ethics lectures, unable to bear sitting through a meticulous unpacking of the complexities underlying the abortion or euthanasia debates, I would routinely skive off to play pool and smoke joints. For a while I considered dropping out, but I had come to philosophy after dropping out of an even duller subject. And to do so again would be to invite the dangerous conclusion that there was no subject that could hold my attention. Philosophy was all about the exaltation of reason, yet what got me through my studies was the often stridently unreasonable work of thinkers like Bataille and Nietzsche. While Bataille was treated warily by academic staff, he had far more draw for me than even such a colossal figure as Kant, who I could never really bring myself to read which is a little like studying physics and ignoring Einstein. Like Borges, I viewed metaphysics as a branch of fantastical literature, embracing ideas not so much for their truth value as for their force of astonishment. When I finished my studies and moved into the great open world, these wild and unreasonable thinkers were the ones who stayed with me, who I continued reading, who I am still reading now. In the spring of 2015, not long after I had stayed with my friend Zoe, I fulfilled a long-held desire and moved to Paris. I lived in the 19th arrondissement, first near the Canal Saint-Martin with my girlfriend, and then by the Parc de Bouchamont on my own. One afternoon in early summer, wandering through the Pompidou Centre, I came across a display detailing George Bataille's, George Bataille's relationship with the Surrealist movement and his influence on the avant-garde in general. Bataille was acknowledged as a central figure in the avant-garde's struggle to surmount the absence of myth in the modern world. In black and white photographs taken on Paris streets, Bataille was as well-groomed as ever, peering out from the past with those serene, kindly eyes that belied the rage and revulsion of his thought. Being at a loose end, I decided to visit some of the sites and addresses relating to the life of this weird author whose work had marked my own weird youth. On a drizzly late Sunday morning in August, I left my flat and took the metro to Pigalle. As is not uncommon in Paris, there was a condom machine by the bottom of the stairway leading out of Pigalle station. Paris is widely known as the city of lights, but to me it was the city of condoms. Everywhere I looked, I saw them. When I'd moved into my place by the park, a superlatively bohemian dwelling. It was falling apart, basically. The young woman I was renting from while she was away in Mexico had, ev had evidently been in too much of a rush to clean up the bedroom. I knew this because of the large open box of condoms and the overfull ashtray on the bedside table, not to mention the clutter and dishevelment everywhere else. I didn't mind. In fact, I was pleased by it this unwillingness to dispel the stereotype of the Parisian artist, the woman was a filmmaker, languid sex, dubious hygiene standards, chain smoking. To me, the condoms and ashtray were like the suite that hoteliers leave on the pillow for when you check into a room, a welcoming touch. I emerged from Pigalle station onto the Boulevard de Clichy, one of Paris's seedier zones with its sex shops, strip joints and the Moulin Rouge. The first time I'd come to Paris a decade earlier, I'd had a nasty experience around here. After spending the day at the Musée d'Orsay, my girlfriend and I had decided to see a strip show. We entered, took our seats at a table in the darkness, and awkwardly watched women with ravaged faces and surgically remade bodies gyrate indifferently around a pole, one after the other. 
I remember being appalled and fascinated by one of the strippers in particular, a blonde with narrow shaded eyes. Her face was harsh and run through with lines of age, but her breasts were immense, upright and gleaming. She seemed to me a kind of minotaur. An enormous black man in a tuxedo appeared at our table and grinningly asked us what we would have to drink, pointing to a laminated menu he briefly held before us. We ordered seven up and vodkas. A while later, just as we were deciding it was time to leave, the waiter returned and placed our bill on the table in a little plastic dish. What it said was this, 440 euro. We rose to our feet in protest. The waiter's arm thrust out to block our exit. Two other men materialized and circled us, shouting in our faces. I said I wanted to call the police and their roars got louder. One of them poked his finger in my chest. Eventually we managed to convince them that all we had on us was 25 euro. I handed over the bills and we walked out of there with what dignity we still had, which was none. In hindsight, it seems unlikely that they would have assaulted us. I later learned that this is a common scam at strip clubs. But at the time, I found it prudent to hide behind my girlfriend and suggest she sort this out because she knew French. She could say, please, thank you, and where can I find a metro? Now the streets around Clichy were Sunday quiet. Men sat outside cafes, nursing glasses of beer or coffees. Some drank pasties. One or two of them even wore berets. It is commonly said that the old Paris is dead and gone. The literary Paris of, splen of splenetic flaneurs, warring avant-garde factions and promiscuous philosophers. The real Paris, this narrative insists, is now to be found outside the periphery, in the, sp in the sprawl of the banlieue, which are addled with poverty and hate. In this reading, Paris's 20 arrondissements are bounded by the peripherique, comprise a bourgeois enclave, obsolete and fated to be overrun by the scorned, the excluded, the enraged. All those post-colonial hens come home to roost. Sure enough, a week after I left Paris, an Islamist suicide commando would wreak carnage on some of the city's trendiest quarters, intensifying an era of fear and vulnerability. Glancing around Pigalle on this grey morning, though, it was clear that one could still live out the Parisian dream, or the cliché, with ample cultural props to flesh out the illusion. For instance, this young, stylish, douzmoish couple kissing and smoking over their thimblefuls of coffee on the Place André Breton. So I was on the right track, and sure enough, a minute later, I was standing outside 42 Rue Pierre Fontaine, the address that Breton had commandeered as the headquarters of the Surrealist movement for 40-odd years. The word headquarters, with its martial overtones, is apt. Like many of the avant-garde movements of the period, Surrealism was run on near military lines, with Breton as its ruthless general, calling the shots on who was to be purged and excommunicated, allying his forces with the global struggles against capitalism and fascism. Reading about the spats and fissures, I wondered if they weren't all just playing around a little bit. It did look like fun, the art militancy and bitchy factionalism. More likely, though, they were in deadly earnest, sandwiched as they were between new, two near-apocalyptic wars, and it was me and my video game culture that lacked seriousness. As if in oblique sympathy with my thinking, the one-time headquarters of Surrealism had since been transformed into the Comédie de Paris, a stand-up venue. On either side of the road there were sex shops and Vietnamese restaurants. A few doors down was the dilapidated shell of a monoprix supermarket. A plaque on the wall commemorating Breton and the Surrealists included a quote, Je cherche le haut du temps. As I stood there, a woman who I fancifully imagined was a prostitute walked past, smoking a cigarette and holding open a hefty paperback, reading as she strode. A thin, dark man began to roar into his phone in Arabic, gesticulating furiously. He turned the corner and the street fell quiet again. 
I watched a cute girl in, in tight blue jeans cross the road at the traffic lights. Idly, I thought about getting a prostitute. It would have been nice just then. I found myself regretting that I didn't come from a culture in which paying for sex was easy and natural, a norm, like in South American novels. So that was from my new book, Threshold. You can all buy it it's in all the shops. Um, thank you very much for listening this evening. And uh, this has been an Alliance Francaise event. And stay tuned. Have a look at their Facebook and social media for upcoming events. There's plenty more events on the way. Um, you can connect with me via Instagram. I'm called Skull Hotel, S-K-U-L-L Hotel. Or I'm on Twitter, too. So I don't really use it, that one. Okay, good night. Thank you.